In today's video, we're going to take a look at one of the first handhelds to ship out of the box with SteamOS that's not a Steam Deck. Now, this is not technically the first handheld to come with SteamOS other than a Steam Deck. It is the same handheld, but with a different chipset inside. So the one that we have here today is the Z1 Extreme variant. So that is going to be the same chipset that came in both the ROG Ally and Ally X and a very similar architecture to what came in the original Lenovo Legion Go. But I wanted to do some comparisons against other handhelds. We'll do some gameplay and give you my overall thoughts and opinions on the device. And the way that Lenovo is going about making this device is a little bit strange, if you ask me. So there was another model that came previous to this that had a Z2 Go chip. And for those that are confused, Z2 does not necessarily mean better because the Go at the end of Z2 Go basically means it's a stripped down APU more tailored to compete with something like the APU that's inside of the Steam Deck and offer better battery efficiency. But it just really wasn't a great performer. This Z1 E chip has been tried and true. We know it works really well with things like the ROG Ally X that I mentioned earlier. However, it's kind of in a weird stage because there's a bunch of products that are about to come out using the full blown Z2 chip, as well as some even more powerful things from AMD like the Strict Halos. So it's just kind of a weird product release because the first product they released was kind of not as powerful. And then we get this one here, which is technically more powerful than that, but it's last gen tech and a new device. But we're going to look at it nonetheless, because it is still a great time to use, albeit with a couple small drawbacks. So without further ado, let's get into it. Now, the first thing I want to talk about is the thing that caught my eye, no pun intended. It's the enormous eight inch 1200 P screen. This is an IPS screen. It runs at 120 Hertz. It's got some pretty deep colors, um, and it does look really nice. It gets 500 nits of brightness, which is plenty bright, comparable to things like the Steam Deck and things of that nature. And I really enjoy this display. A lot of people have complained, as you may have been able to tell already in this video, that this is a super, super reflective screen. So I know that there's kind of a war constantly going on with people between the etched glass and then the glossy glass. Just know that think of your most reflective screen that you've seen, something like an iPhone or something of that nature. This is going to be worse than that. It doesn't tend to bother me too much unless I'm trying to film it for a YouTube video and you can see pretty much everything that's going on in the room with it. But in real use, you know, when you have it kind of turned up towards you and you're playing games, it's not an issue for me personally. And because this comes with SteamOS right out of the box, you can actually go down and change the refresh rate on the screen or the frame rate limit in your game to be able to get the most out of this screen. And because we have a 120 hertz screen, we can actually go down to 40 FPS and it's going to still be able to keep that refresh rate at 120 hertz and it's going to make things look pretty smooth if you're not able to hit something like say 60 FPS. And another amazing benefit of this screen is the fact that it is a VRR screen. So for those that don't know what that means, it's basically a variable refresh rate. It means that the refresh rate will sync with the game. So if you are, say, unable to keep a constant or steady FPS or you're playing, you know, above 60 FPS or above 40 FPS, but it's not consistent in what that frame rate is, it's going to help this to look a lot more smooth and stop it from kind of stuttering and having like screen tearing issues and things like that. So it's a really good feature to have on a handheld where you're trying to squeeze out as much power as you possibly can. Now Lenovo chose to go with a 16 by 10 aspect ratio on the screen similar to or actually exactly the same as something like your Steam Deck. And I really appreciate that. The ROG Ally lineup of handhelds uses 16 by 9, which is kind of your standard television aspect ratio. And the difference is that the screen with 16 by 10 is just a little bit taller instead of wider. And I feel that that is perfect for things that are sitting up close to your face because you're kind of staring into the center of your vision. You're not really looking off to the sides. And it just kind of helps it to feel a little more filled in. And it works better with different things like emulators. And you're going to scale into different aspect ratios. 16 by 10 is just overall better. I've even noticed the entire market on gaming laptops have seemed to shift over to 16 by 10. And it's just something that, you know, I don't want to go back from. So every time that I put this down and pick back up my ROG Ally X, it's like the first thing I notice. It's not even so much the screen size. I could deal with a 7-inch screen. But the fact that it is 16 by 9 over here just makes it feel so much smaller for some reason. 
So I really do appreciate the fact that we have a nice, big, beautiful 8-inch 16 by 10 screen here. Now, I actually got to get hands-on with this device earlier in the year at CES. It was the Z2 Go model, but it was this form factor. And the first thing that I and all my other YouTuber friends noticed was how comfortable and ergonomic it was, especially compared to the original Lenovo Legion Go. For a long time, I feel like the gold standard for ergonomics and comfort in a PC handheld has always been kind of given the crown to the Steam Deck. And this has a very similar design choice where it has this nice bowing and bubbling in the back, gives you something to kind of reach into with your fingertips. I would say that this is almost as comfortable as the Steam Deck, except for the fact that I noticed that this roundedness kind of starts more in the middle of the device here on the side, where the Steam Deck is mostly flat until you get to the bottom corner. And for those with small hands like me, I feel like that can be a little less comfortable, but not uncomfortable by any means. And I really appreciate the fact that they kind of took the biggest criticism from their last device and did something about it because it seems like a lot of these companies don't really take feedback and apply it until maybe several generations later. And one thing that I absolutely love is that I don't need to use any sort of case with this. I like to use my handhelds naked. I know that's kind of crazy. I don't even have a screen protector on my Steam Deck OLED and I bring this thing with me everywhere, but I just prefer to not have to use a case. I know a lot of people are the same. They feel like having to buy, you know, a five, six, seven, eight hundred dollar device and then start stacking on accessories just to kind of make it ideal kind of feels less thought out for them and they don't like it. You can use, say, something like the ROG Ally X or the ROG Ally without a case, but I do find that the added weight from the battery in this thing, it's just not super comfortable. So I have one of these little knockoff cases, and it's really, really textured, so it keeps it from slipping down in your hands. And on the kind of point of texture, I think that that was the last thing that they were kind of missing on this. I think if this texture was just a little bit more rough or a little bit more grippy, it would have made this thing absolutely amazing when it comes to ergonomics. But I would still say it gets an 8 out of 10. It definitely passes. You don't necessarily need to buy anything to use this thing comfortably. Moving into gaming, I kind of wanted to talk about the controls for a little bit here. Now, I would say that this is kind of one of the weaker points of this device. I think that the triggers specifically have a very extremely short travel range, and they're also kind of positioned in a weird spot. I think they should be a little lower on the device than where they actually are. I think they were just kind of trying to go for aesthetics here and fill in all that space at the top of the device, but it feels like the trigger should be much lower than they sit. And the short range of travel is kind of a bummer when it comes to things like racing games or even this game here, Spider-Man 2, where you're always going to be actuating the triggers. There's just not a lot of range of motions. They don't really feel super stiff either. They're kind of loose, so there's not like a whole lot of control in between. It's definitely something you can get by with on most games, but in particular racing games and things where you're constantly depending on those triggers, it's something you're definitely going to notice for sure. Now, the good thing is the triggers are actually quite nice for first-person shooters. The shorter range of travel and kind of the lighter spring weight kind of makes it a little less exhausting if you're going to be using them all the time in that scenario. And an added benefit is if you actually flip around to the back, there is this little click-in that you can flip up to, and it's going to instantly give you basically a hair trigger. So if you want to have a quicker rebound from you know the bottom of the trigger all the way back up to the top for things like semi-automatic weapons, it's going to be a lot better for that. Now to talk about the thumbsticks, I'm going to play a game that I like to play quite a lot. I have several hundred hours into this game. It's called Session Skateboarding. Now this is a simulation skateboarding game that pretty much you control the entire player using just the triggers and the thumbsticks here. And the way it works is your back foot is your right, you know, thumbstick over here and your left foot is your left, which makes sense, obviously, when you put it together. And the reason why I like to use this as a test is because it's all about kind of accurate input as well as kind of comfort. And I will say that the thumbsticks are accurate. They have a good spring to them. They're not like the original Ally where they had that really loose spring that everybody didn't like. But they're not quite as tight as something like the Ally X or even like your standard Xbox controller. But they're really good for that. The only thing I don't love is if you look closely here, the topper itself is super smooth. There's no sort of like grip or anything. They have little itty bitty ridges here on the side, but you really can't feel them. They're more for show than anything. 
Now, the good thing is, I guess this is something you could remedy pretty easy with like a stick topper or something like that. But I just would have preferred for them to maybe have that right out of the box because, yeah, they're very slick, especially if you're going to be, you know, using this thing with any sort of oils or anything on your hands. They're just going to be a little bit more slippery and uncomfortable. And the rest of the controls on the device and everything kind of all together is just fine. Nothing is terrible here. Nothing is making me not like the device because of, say, any of the inputs. I really despise the original thumbsticks on the ROG Ally to the point where I never wanted to use the device and I eventually sold it until I could upgrade to the Ally X. Nothing here is quite on that level of bad. However, I will say that some of the things just feel a little cheap. I'm not a big fan of this D-pad. I think it's good. It's just not great. One of the major downsides, though, however, is how noisy this device is. So I don't know how well my microphone's going to pick it up, but I'm going to show you just how clicky and clacky some of these buttons really can be. So yeah, it can get kind of noisy. This is definitely not something that you're going to be able to avoid either. I wasn't really exerting any extra force on any of the buttons, especially the face buttons up here, the start, the select, and the steam buttons, as well as the bumpers. They just all are pretty clacky no matter how hard you're trying to push them in, which is kind of a bummer. And speaking of noises coming out of this device, just like the original Legion Go, the speakers here are nothing special. They're actually... Pretty muffled and quiet, if you ask me. I was using this in bed next to my wife, who was just casually browsing her phone. And with her phone like three feet away from me, it was completely drowning out all of the sound coming from this device. Now, you can, of course, you know, put in a pair of headphones up top or connect a pair of Bluetooth ones. But if you're coming from something like this Steam Deck, it's just kind of an overall disappointment. I really wish that they would have kind of kicked it up a notch when their last device was already kind of known to not have amazing sound. They'll get you by, I'm sure, but if you're anywhere in an outdoor environment or anywhere where there's going to be other sounds, it's probably going to be hard to hear this thing. And one last noise with this device is the fan. I find the fan to be a little bit more audible than I thought it would be, but it's honestly not like a whiny sort of fan sound or anything like that. So it's not uncomfortable. I mean, obviously, it has to suck in air through this whole thing and blow it out through the top here. So it is definitely something that you're going to hear. It's not completely silent, but I think it's okay. It's nothing that's worrisome, in my opinion. We do also have a pair of extra grip buttons here on the back. There's only two. There's not four like the Steam Deck, but I think that they're in a good spot where you can actually reach them if you need to, but I've never bothered to map them to anything. They're also noisy, just like all the other buttons that I pointed out earlier. So it's just something to keep in mind. But it's good to have those. You know, some games, it's better to be able to keep your fingers on the triggers and the thumbsticks and not have to take them off to touch something on the face button. If you can map one of those face buttons back here, it might give you like a competitive advantage or something like that in a first person shooter. So it's nice that they have it. So we have two USB C ports at the top as well as a 3.5 millimeter audio jack. I'm happy to see that we have two USB C ports because I do like to use a lot of my devices with things like XR glasses when I travel. So it's always handy to have that second USB right there. It does support 65 watt fast charging. And that brings me to probably the number one sore spot of this device. And that's the battery size. So this only has a 55 watt hour battery. So compared to things like the ROG Ally X, which now ship with an 80 watt hour battery, you're going to have significantly less battery life. I'd say if you're, you know, in all out performance mode, you're looking at around an hour or maybe a little over an hour in some games. But if you're using it in more of a balanced preset that they have here, you might be able to get closer to two or maybe a little over two, depending on the game and your settings. But it would have been nice to see 80 watt hours in here, especially because this is coming in at such a premium price. Now, at the time of recording, this device is $830, which is definitely putting in ROG Ally X territory and maybe even closer to some of those other handhelds that will be coming out later this year. And I guarantee a lot of those are going to be looking to have some heftier batteries. So that is a drawback. I was able to pick this up on a Best Buy flash deal and combine it with an open box in excellent condition to actually score this for 700 bucks. And I thought for $700, that's a pretty good deal. It's not amazing. I think it's probably about where they should have priced this thing to begin with. 
But again, the world's kind of in the middle of a trade fiasco with tariffs and stuff like that. So who knows what they maybe originally wanted to price this at, but kind of had to change last minute due to all that going on. And maybe we'll see a reduction in the future, hopefully not an increase. But yeah, 55 watt hour battery compared to something like the ROG Ally X, which has been out for a while now, and maybe you can get one on the secondhand market, is a little bit rough. However, I will say part of that pricing that they have chose to go with is the fact that this does also have 32 gigabytes of RAM. So having more RAM with an APU is always better because you can then feed more of the RAM to VRAM and help you with games that really are VRAM hungry, which seems to be kind of a growing trend in gaming. So you may see a slight bump in performance on certain games compared to something like the ROG Ally X. So if you're trying to get a, you know, idea of performance on this thing, if you're looking up videos of, say, the ROG Ally X and what that device can run, this will be able to run all those games exactly the same. And maybe in some instances, like, you know, a 5% or not 5%, 5 FPS increase just due to that added VRAM. And when it comes to storage, this does come with a one terabyte 2242 SSD inside. But the good news is you can actually just open this up and swap it out for a full size 2280 SSD if you're looking to save some money and expand your storage. And then you also have a third option down below where you can actually just use a micro SD card. Steam has done a lot of work to make sure that it's super plug and play to just pop in an SD card format it and then add your games and you know of course it's not going to be as fast as the internal storage but it's a great low budget option if you have to you know kind of install some more stuff and you're in a pinch and you don't want to buy a whole new ssd sd cards do work and it doesn't seem like it has the same kind of failure issues that other devices have had due to heat and things like that so from what i've seen online the sd card slot seems to be pretty reliable now, before we end today's video, there's a couple of things that I kind of glossed over. And I think personally for me, it's just because they're things that I'm used to on other handhelds. So they don't jump out at me as much, but it's, you know, something worth talking about for people that may be looking to get this as their first handheld. SteamOS is without a doubt a better operating system to use than Windows for 90% of use cases with a handheld. The suspend feature on here, you just press the power button, it goes to sleep. It doesn't mess anything up in the background or you don't have a bunch of, you know, Windows bloat and updates really bogging down your performance at the worst possible time. It's just easy to navigate with the controls. Yes, this device does have a trackpad over here, and I didn't even really get into that. It's not fantastic, but it'll get you by. Um, but yes, yeah, SteamOS really is going to allow you to dial in, you know, your performance exactly how you want it to. You can go in here and change things on the fly to either get the best battery life or the best performance, whichever you're after. And it's just overall a fantastic experience. There are obviously some small drawbacks like games with anti-cheat and things like Game Pass not being available on SteamOS. But down the road, if you really, really miss those things to the point where you're really upset about it, this chipset does support Windows. You could install Windows or do a dual boot setup. But keep in mind that the price point that they're including at $830 for this is not going to get you a Windows key. So you're on your own for that. And with that being said, I think that $830 for this is just not the right price for this device at the time that it's coming out. It's kind of competitive with things like the ROG Ally X, but that does have a much bigger battery life. So I mean, if you're debating between the two and battery life is not an issue, maybe it's not a big deal. But I would definitely say try to look out for a sale at Best Buy. I was able, like I said earlier, to pick this up for around 700 bucks by combining a deal that they already had on all of the Lenovo Legion Go products, and then finding an open box one. And they do do open box in a few different tiers. There's like excellent, good and like poor it's always worth trying to drive to the store and kind of determining for yourself because as someone who worked at Best Buy many years ago, we might put poor condition on it just because the charger has like some goo or something on it that can be cleaned off. Or maybe there's like a sticker that you can peel off and it left some residue. So it's always worth kind of seeing for yourself and seeing how much of a good deal you can get with one of those open box deals or just keep your eyes peeled on the secondhand market. I do think that this is, in my opinion, like a $700 device. I don't think it should have went much over that. But, you know, keep that in mind. If you're really looking at this thing, thinking that you want it, it's always a good idea to try to pick it up from somewhere like that with an easy return process and where you can get hands-on with it and kind of get yourself the best deal. But 
Thank you guys so much for watching. If you're new here, make sure you hit the subscribe button down below, and we'll see you in the next one.